All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, 70 uh, seminar series at Johns Hopkins and the FM Kirby uh, Research Center at Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, so this is um, actually our first um, hybrid meeting. Um, so we have uh, lo local folks joining us in person and uh, people um, from all over the world uh, join us online. Um, so today uh, our speaker is uh, Dr. Lawrence Huber and many know him as uh, Renzo. Um, so I myself, I got, I got to know Renzo um, when he was a graduate student uh, with uh, Bob Turner in Leipzig. So back then, uh, you know, we had some, um, uh, you know, uh, discussion about, uh, you know, Vaso, and uh, he has been a very enthusiastic, um, you know, um, uh, developing uh, Vaso technology on 70, especially for layer functional MRI. And, um, you know, of course, later on, we all know, uh, you know, he, he developed his own method, uh, you know, the vaso sequence combined with the fold measurement uh, with a nice foci pulse to shorten TI and did lots of a nice work. And I think he is the person who basically initiated the layer function in my vaso field and has been doing great work uh, since then. And then uh, after that, uh, I think uh, Renzo um, uh, decided to uh, join the NIH, Dr. Peter uh, Benettini's group for his postdoc um, uh, project, uh, postdoc training. And it was a very, very happy because, um, because we become a uh, become neighbor for several years. Um, and uh, during, uh, during which he helped a lot of people uh, start their layer functional MRI uh, projects, including myself, um, and uh, continue to do, do lots of nice work. And then he moved to uh, Maastricht University um, uh, for, uh, for several years and continue to do the, do the developments. And then uh, last year in London at the RCMI, and Renzo told me he's coming back to the NIH again. So I was very happy to, uh, to learn that, very excited. And then I thought uh, he might be the first, uh, the, the, the perfect person uh, to kick off uh, this year's uh, 70 uh, lectures um, here. So um, I'm very happy, uh, you know, Renzo came here today and uh, I think he's gonna talk about uh, the latest developments in the field of layer functional MI uh, basal. It's all yours, Renzo, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jun. Thanks all of, um, for being here and, and having me. I'm excited to be here. And I'm excited to be here again, like um, during the postdoc days when I was at NIH, like we are neighbors. So, so I was here twice already. So it's nice to be here um, again. I think last time was 2018, we talked about it earlier. Um, so I figured I'd talk about the things that um, I'm excited about that happened since 2018, um, namely the latest developments. And um, I'm particularly interested in method development for like high resolution fMRI. And even though high resolutions are kind of super exciting, um, I need to figure out how to advance slides. So I can hang in there. There we go. So even though high resolutions are exciting, already at low resolutions, fMRI development is pretty cool because it taught us a lot about how the big structures of the brain work, right? How there are these visual centers that are responsible for visual perception, the areas involved in moving the body, listening, and these uniquely human abilities like language. Though exciting as it is to see the brain in action at low resolutions, sometimes it's also a bit frustrating how little we learn about the brain and how it works by looking at these kind of fuzzy fMRI blobs like those. It's somewhat comparable, like trying to understand the brain by looking at these fuzzy fMRI blobs is somewhat comparable as trying to understand how a truck engine works by looking at it with an infrared camera. You kind of roughly know the big parts that seem to be involved and then seem to consume a lot of energy, but you learn very little about the kind of the, the mechanics, how it actually works if you don't have the resolution to see the kind of densely packed microcircuitry. So at ultra high field strength with high resolutions, you can approach the spatial regime where you not only distinguish voxels of different tissue types, like gray matter, white matter, CSF, but also you see distributions within the tissues, AKA the layers. And those layers are exciting because they contain different neurons that do different things of neural processing. So going from a conventional fMRI voxel of maybe three millimeters to submillimeter resolutions like that one, you can start to spatially subsample these different neural populations. And 
This is important because it does not only tell us if a given brain area is involved in a certain task, but importantly also kind of where this activity is coming from, how it's following the different processing steps, how it's modulated by input from other brain areas until you have a result of the neural compu computation that sends output to further areas with respective feedback and so on. So high resolution layer dependent fMRI does not only tell us which areas are connected with each other and which of those connections are stronger than others, but importantly, it tells us something about the directionality, the causality of these connections, which is exciting. To get to those layer resolutions, however, is not trivial and the field has come a long way and there's still a long way to go, which I would like to explain with this little metaphor of looking at telescopes. So let's look at this beautiful night sky. And if you have a very sensitive chip, you can see that there are these kind of clouds in there. And when you zoom in, you see there's a lot of structure and there are these subclouds. And then you can zoom in further and further and further until you ultimately hit the resolution limit of earthbound telescopes, like the, the one in Chile and Asia. With a lot of hardware improvements though, you can do better, right? Um, and you can see the nice kind of outlines, the borders of these clouds, and there's a lot of structure there. Though with even more hardware upgrades, or also in combination with software, then you can even see kind of the dynamics within those clouds. So resolution is key to, to obtain new resolution, uh, new information at that spatial scale. And I like this metaphor because this is just about the time scale of fMRI development. So the, the important step happened in the early um, 90s where you could distinguish kind of the big structures, right? The kind of somatosensory areas from other brain areas at the resolution of voxel sizes of about 250 microliter. Now with a lot of hardware improvements over two and a half decades, we ended up as a field at about one microliter. And there is this Moore's law of fMRI that every decade or so you gain about an order of magnitude in, in voxel volume. So now, yet a decade later, with the same old kind of crappy hardware still, but with a lot of software improvements, aka sequences, we end up at about 0.1 microliter, where you not only distinguish kind of these very close brain areas, like the somatosensory from the motor cortex, but also you see more and more structure within the gray matter which I want to highlight here, because there's a lot of information down there, specifically kind of looking at these voxels that kind of seem to form a line following the cortical ribbon, which we would like to interpret as layers. But there's also other stuff, for example, these kind of pillar-like stripes over there that not so many people have seen so far, so I'm not really sure what they are, vascular or neural origin or something else. But it definitely shows us that in the functional responses, that there's a lot of fine scale structure. For example, when you look at the EPI underlay instead, you see that now we have about 10 voxels across cortical depth, but still they kind of all have the same like intensity, right? So there's not so much point, there's not so much information that jumps at you when you look at the structural contrast as opposed to the, the, functional, the functional one. Though to get to these kind of resolutions, there are, I think, two important challenges that I would like to talk about each in the next few slides. Namely, first the readout and then the contrast. And on the readout, you can already see it kind of that you see that this is not a flash based image, right? You see that this is EPI, which has EPI issues. And you may be seeing this even better when you look at the single TR images here, where Kind of, we have these dark spots and these white spots, and there are these kind of banana clouds and all these wiggles, which becomes even clearer when you like just invert the contrast, right? Where you where you kind of see that there's a lot of variance going on there, and this variance that we are limited by is not necessarily kind of the salt pepper noise that you also see there, but the salt pepper noise is not as limiting as, as the EPI problems. So I want to talk about those artifacts a bit more now, because I do think they are the limit what kind of holds us back to reach the next order of magnitude, maybe in the next decade or so. Because in telescopes, they do it, right? The HabEx telescope is already being designed. What are we doing to, to get to the next order of magnitude? And I think it's those artifacts. And they're limiting us um, not only with respect to spatial resolution, but also temporal resolution. So for example, when we consider a fairly regular whole brain protocol with about 0.8 millimeter resolution, that seems to be kind of standard for many applications, you end up with TRs that are quite long. Neuroscientists don't want to have those long TRs. They want to be faster. So you can kind of push it further and further and further and ultimately end up with images that are 
useless. But the reason why they are useless is not just salt pepper noise. It's those wiggly artifacts that are limiting us. And the same for spatial resolution. So here, a three Tesla example where when you go from 0.8 millimeter slab protocol to 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, at the end, it's not only the salt pepper noise that limits us. It's these kind of weird inconsistencies that make those data ultimately unusable. And this is kind of a current concern of mine, where together with Rüdiger Stirnberg from the DZNA, we are trying to develop kind of strategies for fMRI to kind of get rid of them or correct for them somehow. And we believe they are a result of multiple different problems in EPI. B0 is part of the, the thing. I think the more pressing problem are deviations of gradient trajectories from the ideal case. So when you look at an EPI readout and you measure the gradients, for example, with scope, you can see that there are these errors, um, gradient delays, the eddy currents. Um, importantly, however, when you're really pushing them to their limits, you do see that the errors are kind of spiky. In across K space. And they're not just delays, right? They are so usually in reconstruction pipelines, you just try to shift the odd and even lines. But here you already see that this approach might not be the most appropriate case for layer FMI because we have this overestimation of the gradient both at the rising corner and the falling corner. And since we always need to do ramp sampling in EPI because we are in high resolution EPI, because we're already limited to get these large matrices in a limited amount of time, they are kind of right during the acquisition, like while the ADCs are open. So you can see that standard phase correction does not solve for those, but importantly also kind of these um, crapper based approaches, for example, dual polarity crapper might not account for all of those too, because um, you cannot, like they are very spiky in K-space. You cannot correct for them with a small crapper kernel that's applied everywhere in K-space. Though what you can do is try to just live with them, but make them consistent across all the K-space lines. For example, having a calibration scan or even doing it during your readout where you invert the read direction and then have the errors um, for odd and even TRs, for example, where you can see here that you can basically have those ghosts that are kind of low spatial frequency ghosts not kind of complete Nyquist ghosts. And then um, as soon as you quantify them, you, you correct for them, which gives you back kind of decent looking images and allows you to do 0.5 millimeter three Tesla for that matter, which then allows you to do an fMRI. For example, here looking at a 15 minute movie watching paradigm where in resting state, you do see that usually with those artifacts, you have all these kind of false correlations or anti-correlations. Whereas when you correct for it by knowing the the artifact, you can kind of get decent looking visual networks out of it. But this kind of approach of the dual polarity readout might also be helpful to see areas that maybe Jun also might be interested about, namely like kind of these deep brain structures that have, um, that are like consistently challenging at seven Tesla for multiple reasons, because they're kind of far away from the RF channels. And as soon as you have ghosts and in, and that kind of screw up your image acceleration, where in Grappa or Sense, you kind of try to unalias images by knowing the aliasing pattern. And now, since you have errors in your aliasing pattern, the unaliasing obviously um, fails. So you can see here that um, in those stripes that we, we care about, we have these kind of radius in there, which might be better appreciable when you look at the artifact only. Though doing this kind of calibration approach, you can see that they kind of nicely disappear and the EPI becomes a bit more flash-like. All right, um, until now, there are about uh, 200 human layer-dependent fMRI papers published in the field. And a good chunk of them made their, pub their data publicly available. And I looked at all of them. And in every single one of them, I do find the same artifacts. So I think this is not just um, something that's annoying in some of the slices that I'm seeing, but this is actually limiting us in the field. So here, this is an example from um, us in Bethesda, where you kind of see these low spatial errors, these kind of banana clouds or fuzzy ripples, we call them. This is now a 2D EPI example, where especially in the TSNR maps, you see it. This is from Nijmegen and Essen, I think again, a 3D EPI. This is from Cambridge. You always have these kind of fuzzy banana clouds, darkenings. This is from Maastricht in Leipzig with assumed approach. 
in Los Angeles with 3D Grace or in Glasgow, in Liege, where it's sometimes quite severe, in Korea, in Magdeburg, also on Philips scanners, especially in the TSNR, you kind of see these stripes that are just where it becomes obvious that you're looking at EPI and not kind of an artifact free flash like image or another multi band example here where I want to make the point that these artifacts that you all might be familiar with are not just a bit of an annoyance in conventional high resolution protocols of 0.8 millimeters, but I do want to claim that the reason why conventional protocols do use 0.8 millimeters is because if you would push it further, those artifacts would limit us. So I talked a lot about those readout challenges to get us to these high resolutions. Let's talk about the contrast too. So why do we not see a lot of false activity kind of between the two sides of the cent central sulcus here? And I will try to find the shortcut now to hide those. Uh, do you remember it, June? It was alt shift H, I think. Okay, we just live with it. Um, the contrast. So with conventional brain like cobalt, we would expect that we see oxygenation changes, um, especially also in the large straining veins right above the cortical surface. In order to get rid of them, I'm using this other method that was mentioned by June in the introduction, namely vascular space occupancy, aka basal, which was developed right here by Han Chang Lu and Peter van Sai, and was then first ported to 7 Tesla by June. And I'm using a specific version that was originally conceptualized from Yin and Sonji Kim, and I'm using a specific adapt adaptation of that one for human um, applications. And no matter which version of VASO you're using, you always kind of assume a two compartment model, which I would like to explain in this little cartoon model over here where I have two magnetization vectors. The blue one represents the tissue magnetization and the red one represents the blood magnetization. So in equilibrium, they kind of align along the external direction of the magnetic external magnetic field. And then in VASO, we start every TR by applying a global inversion pulse that flips around those magnetizations. And then the idea is that they have different relaxation rates and tissue decays faster than blood. So blood here is going through zero right about now. And this is the time when we apply, apply when we send a excitation pulse and have a signal readout. So right during this time, we actually don't have any blood magnetization available. So all the magnetization and the signal in our image must come from the extravascular space. This means that all these large straining veins and the signal um, of the intravascular space is actually completely nulled out. So black here means no signal. And then when there's neural activity increase and um, there's more oxygen demand, more demand for glucose, the small vessels open up and dilate. And, close to the location of the, the laminar neural structures. So VASO is a, is a negative contrast that is believed to be more locally specific compared to other methods, for example, like, like gradient equibold. And in the last decades, there has been quite an extensive um, discussion to trying to find kind of the, the ultimate best method for high resolution fMRI. And there has been no consensus yet. And I think there will never be a consensus and this discussion was maybe unfortunately sometimes a bit politically motivated too. So I cannot tell you which method is best, but I can tell you what people are using. So looking at the 200 papers of layer dependent fMRI out there, about a quarter of them is just using gradient echo bold, kind of ignoring the problem of local unspecificity of large training veins and then hope for the best. And often you can get the right neuroscience answer with gradient echo bold. About a quarter of the papers is using gradient echo bold, but mention in their discussion maybe being forced by reviewers or so, that there might actually be another method that might be more suitable. About half of the layer fMRI papers out there do use a combination of methods. The most commonly used, easiest applicable gradient echo bolt and something else. And by something else, I'm thinking of spin echo, EPI or T2 prep, upcoming and hot or, or base or ASL and, and, and 3D grace and so on, which all have their own kind of compromise between localization specificity to individual layers or sensitivity to see something um, significant within a given um, time frame of a run or kind of skill set that you need to execute it or, or efficiency to, to cover a certain area. And using this metaphor of the card game, I think already makes it clear that there is no winner, right? You, you, it doesn't really make sense to, to say 
kind of which is the best. It, it depends on which kind of feature you, you, you use to determine which sequence to use. Like, it doesn't make sense to have a discussion if a car is better than an airplane, right? Then it depends where you want to go. And usually it's most efficient to use a combination of methods. Like this morning I took a bike to the train station, used the train and then June picked me up on his car. So it's most efficient to kind of use multiple methods, which I think might be um, hopefully uh, the future discussion, not to find the best method, but which combination. And also being part of the ultra high field community, I sometimes feel I like that guy and that I don't worry about sensitivity that much. Um, like we spend so much time on all these um, seven Tesla scanners to give us a lot of sensitivity. It feels like having a Lamborghini and then worrying about food prices and go to McDonald's. Like have the class to use a method that's worth your, your field strength. So everything that I will show you for the rest of the presentation will be a vessel while I acquire Bolt alongside anyway. So I talked about readout and contrast. So now we can start to interpret these little stripes over there. Um, and I would like to do so by showing you this series of experiments where the same participants was asked to do a conventional finger tapping task where we see a kind of fuzzy blob at three millimeter resolutions that covers kind of the sensory motor areas. But then in another task conditions, we asked the participant to just think about moving their hand without actually engaging the muscles. Where you do see maybe the shape is a bit different, the strength is definitely reduced, but just looking at the blob alone, you cannot really tell what the person is doing, which is kind of frustrating, right? Because the behavior is so substantially different. Now, zooming into a given brain area, really focusing all the sequence power that you have on there and really increase the resolution further and further and further until you are in the sub millimeter regime, then you do start to separate these different stripes where we do believe that the voxels at the cortical surface here are mostly the ones in layer two, three that are responsible for a lot of cortical cortical feedback input, for example, from motor planning areas or somatosensory feedback. Whereas the deeper stripe over here is the ones that's the deep layer four, a uh, deep layer five, sorry. There's no layer four or no thick layer four in primary motor cortex. Deep layer five, layer five B in fact, um, has these huge bed cells that have the direct connections to the spinal cords and then trigger the muscles to move. So we can kind of see the input output characteristic there for this tapping. Then when you ask participants to just have this imaginary tapping, you do not really see this output going on, right? You only see the, the, the input. Um, allowing us then also to find a pendant of the different brain state that re refers to this very different behavior here. Though, as exciting as these kind of studies were to, to convince ourselves that we can modulate different laminar circuits and the different layers engage differently for different tasks, it's still only kind of fulfilling half of the promise of layer-dependent fMRI. Like layer-dependent fMRI promises to, to give us kind of directional connectivity, causality of, of information flow, which we're not really seeing here. Like we see input and output, but we don't really see where the input is coming from or where the output is going. So we kind of, it's ironic that we see kind of connect, connectivity without actual connections. So there was a lot of effort in the last decade um, to kind of push this to have more coverage, not only zoom into individual areas, but really see actual connections. So from starting from an entire patch of the cortex, uh, the motor cortex, for example, to something like an entire slice and then stacking them on top of each other to something like whole brain. Uh, where this was mostly possible due to advanced readout strategies in 3D EPI or other methods, but also due to alternative ways of doing T1 weighting and maintaining the T1 contrast for, for longer amounts of time. And there are a few um, endeavors going into this direction. The one I want to talk about is a study from Kenju Koiso, where we were still looking at the kind of uh, sequence perspective and we're trying to, to quantify if the sequences and acquisition protocols are really usable for neuroscience applications just yet. So it was kind of a, a stability test for that matter. So we ran 51 runs of the same person during a movie watching paradigm where at some point during the movie, every brain area is somewhat engaged. And this was a collection of movie clips from the HCP 70 study, 15 minutes each as um, spread around, uh, I think 13 sessions and the 10 functional sessions are shown here. Where you do see that the same kind of movie networks 
are consistently visible across all the sessions. Maybe session six is a bit uh, weird, but it, it's quite consistent. So I, I do think that these whole brain layer from my basic protocols are getting ready to be applied for neuroscience applications too. And because it's movie watching, we are not kind of limited to these univariate task analyses of activation and rest, but you can also use more, uh, more multivariate analyses. For example, pattern analyses or, or representational similarity analyses where during the movies, which are not starting, I will just close this. Yeah. Okay, I'm still online, Emma. Yeah. So we have those movies. I will not click on them. And for each movie frame, we have a certain spatial distribution of activity. And then you can look at the spatial similarity of the activation pattern for each movie frame to the activation pattern of each other movie frame, giving us these so-called representational similarity or dissimilarity analyses. But when you squint your eyes, you might see some structures already that some movie frames are just more similar than others. And this becomes better visible also when you just average within the movie frames. But you do see that some movie clips are just more similar represented in the brain as opposed to other movie frames. And interestingly, this form of analysis can easily be also compared to behavior. So for example, just asking the person, so you have these two pairs of movie clips, is this pair of movie clips more similar than that pair of movie clips? And then you do see that the movies that are perceived as being more similar are also represented in the brain more similar, or at least in some brain areas, for example, these visual areas, whereas where we see the similar patterns here, whereas in other areas, for example, more cognitive frontal areas, and um, this correspondence with behavior is, is not really there as clearly. And then interestingly, we can also look at the layer dependent pattern on those. For example, seeing that those areas that have this correspondence with behavior are the ones that are middle layer driven, feed forward driven, as opposed to um, other, those other areas that do not match the behavior so well, that are kind of more feedback driven in their similarity, the smaller similarity that is there in fact. So I'm kind of inherently assuming here that middle layer means more feed forward driven and superficial layer means more feedback driven, which I'm actually explaining on this slide over here, assuming the so-called canonical microcircuit, which is being um, summarized by Fellerman van Essen, where we can assume that in any hierarchical brain system, any given brain area receives feed forward input from another area that's lower in the hierarchy via these bottom up connections that terminate in the middle cortical layers. Whereas the same brain area receives feedback input from another area that is higher in the hierarchy, mostly in superficial and or deeper layers. So then by knowing at which layer the activity occurs tells you something about that, like where the input is coming from, from feed forward or feedback. And this kind of simplified model of the um, circuitry across hierarchical brain system then also allows you to kind of build hypotheses that can be applied across brain areas. Here, for example, when you have, look at the functional connectivity of each layer in a given brain area A to each layer in a given brain area B, and you have these off diagonal elements, it would suggest that this brain area is, sends feed forward input to um, area B. Or if it's the other way around, um, for example, if there would be feedback from area to area B, you would expect uh, off-diagonal elements like that, or a common feed-forward input from yet a third area would look like this, and so on. And you can also build null hypotheses based on vascular activity or layer unspecific connections, and can then try to calibrate this model by looking at um, brain systems that are known to, to function hierarchically, and then you just need to kind of match the superposition of your hypotheses and, and see which combination fits best your, your empirical data. But you can also then, as soon as this valid is validated, apply this more to cognitive tasks. For example, here, Kenju is trying to look at decodability in, of faces and houses, which are shown during the movie um, anyway, for some time frames, and then looking at these areas of FFA or PPA, areas that are specifically um, sensitive or believed to, to represent places or, or faces, and um, to see which layer contains the information um, within those respective areas, saying that there is a face represented right now or not. So he basically divides the movies into time frames that either show houses or faces, and then uses a subset of those movie frames 
to train a SVM decoder and then uses other frames that the SVM decoder has not seen yet to try to predict if there was a house visible or a face visible. Where you, we do see that in PPA, the kind of place areas, we have the highest decodability in the middle layers for VASO when you see houses. Whereas for faces, it's kind of, if at all, a bit more feedback driven. Differently though, on FFA, the face sensitive area um, is kind of has this inverted U shape of the feed forward driven um, pattern across layers for the faces and not the houses, which I found quite exciting. Aside of pushing layer fMRI VASO to whole brain to make it more attractive for cognitive neuroscience ap application, you can also do it the other way around. Um, and for example, here, this is a study from Sebastian Tresbach where he wants to explored the capability of layer fMRI VASO to do very fast sampling because neuroscientists sometimes want to do these fast event-related designs and have specific hypotheses about given brain areas. So here we really push the TR to have kind of volume readouts less than a second and then do event-related designs and compare them to kind of conventional block designs. They here for visual cortex and the representative VASO map on the top. And there are, kind of hard lessons that we learned from that. Maybe the first of all is that when you really push your readout to be as fast as possible, you have a huge hit in TSNR. So for long TRs versus short TRs, your TSNR is maybe um, half of it, right? So even though you have more samples for your statistical power, you still need to scan double the amount of time to have the same kind of um, eff efficacy to, to see a given percent change in your fMRI signal. On top of that also for these event-related designs, you're just not giving the HRF enough time to really fully engage and then accumulate and have a huge signal change. So there's a really a double blow there. The, the set scores are maybe a third if you do event-related designs compared to block designs. What does make me excited about this study though is that um, if you're fast enough, you can see these very subtle timing differences across different layers. For example, that the superficial layers are just a, a few seconds or two to uh, one to two seconds or so delayed compared to the middle and deeper layers, which means that when you kind of modulate the timing, for example, with a different task, we should be sensitive to, to seeing that, which might be attractive for cognitive neuroscience studies later. Kind of with all these things being um, more validated and more standardized um, with lay dependent fMRI in the primary um, sensory areas, for example, there was one lesson pretty early on actually that that we learned that made it quite hard also to do layer dependent fMRI. Namely, um, it's very hard to do layer dependent fMRI if you don't really know kind of where you are in a columnar domain too. I think you which I would like to explain on this example here, again, using the toy model of the motor cortex of this input output circuit. And now we are looking at a finger tapping task and a touching task to modulate the input and output layers, where when you zoom into this patch in the motor cortex that is um, representative for this pinch movement, you do see this bimodal response again, namely the input in the superficial layer, output in the deeper layers, and we can modulate this by, for example, doing a passive touch only, where we only have the feedback in the superficial layers for the passive touch without moving the muscles. What I want, the point I want to make here, though, is that when you, you really need to know where to look for it, right? Um, you cannot just um, do layer fMRI without doing columnar imaging, topographical imaging too, because if you just move a few millimeters away, this kind of nice dissociation breaks apart. So we spent quite some effort um, to build acquisition and analysis tools to do kind of more topographical analysis methods and too, which I would like to explain in the model again of the motor cortex looking at individual finger representations. And I would like to um, show this um, here where we tested the animation earlier and it's a bit slow. I apologize for that. So this is kind of an axial like slice where the front of the brain is um, right there and the back of the brain would be right there. And, and the central sulcus is in the middle here. And what we are looking at is kind of using growing flooding algorithms to span surfaces directly in the EPI voxel space. And then you can kind of look at it um, in 3D and basically rotate it and look at it now from the perspective of the back of the brain. So now we are looking at the sensory side of the central sulcus and I'm projecting the individual fingers onto it. So this is the, the pinky finger, the ring finger, the middle finger, index finger and thumb. And in the sensory cortex, it's kind of well-behaved. It's somatotopically organized. 
and I was also surprised how big it is. So a huge chunk of the uh, central sulcus seems to be uh, responsible for, for these finger representations. More interestingly, though, is what happens when you look at the other side, on the motor side. So here, look, I'm turning around and then looking at this little cave over here, which would be the, the hand knob. And again, projecting the pinky finger. Now we have two ring fingers, two middle fingers, two index fingers, and two thumbs, which was kind of puzzling for us at first um, that we have these kind of mirrored representations. And also, these representations are tiny. So this entire hand representation over here seems to be like in the order of um, maybe four millimeters or so. So with conventional resolutions, it would be very, very hard to see. And to, to appreciate that even better, I would like to use a look at a projection in native EPI space um, like there, where you can see that the sensory cortex on the bottom left has these huge hand representations, so much topically aligned, whereas in the motor cortex, we have these kind of mirrored multiple representations. And I do think that I showed preliminary results of this already in 2018. Uh, since then, however, we have looked at more participants where we um, see that in all of them that we looked at, we have at least two of these mirror representations uh, visible in the, in the motor cortex. And interestingly, they also, at the borders of these mirrored finger representations seem to nicely align with patches of the motor cortex that are preferentially activated for grasping versus retraction movements. So unlike the sensory cortex, the motor cortex seems to be more like not really an, a body part map, but more an action map. And it does matter if you kind of use the same thing of like this way or that way with kind of extension or flexion of, of um, it depends which muscle you're using. And since 2018, then we tried to further develop these kind of topographical tools to make them more generalizable also for other brain areas, which is why I want to show this study here from Alessandra Pizzuti, where Farouk Gilman re-implemented most of these flooding tools to be kind of um, more flexible in, in 3D to also work in these kind of highly curled areas, for example, like V5 human MT, which is a visual area that's mostly representing kind of directions of, of visual motion. And Alessandra is particularly interested in columnar representations of axes of motion in, in this area where um, we use these kind of um, flooding algorithms again to um, have a direct correspondence of voxels in the native EPI space to the kind of flattened petri dish space kind of without mesh-based surfaces necessary and interpolations, but basically as a, as a voxel-wise remapping. And again, VASO can be quite helpful here to avoid kind of signal leakage of neighboring columns to be very specific to a given kind of orientation representation. So not really looking at the localization specificity, but more at the kind of task specificity where VASO seems to react very little to other directions and only for um, seems to mostly be specific to a given um, movement axis for that matter. So the tuning with uh, tuning curves are basically sharper, allowing you to kind of look at these individual um, columns of axis of motion and how they are interspaced in, in, the, in V5 human MT. The principles of layer dependent fMRI might also be applicable to inform neurology. So here in a study with Silvina Horowitz, we are trying to explore the usability of layer-dependent fMRI to, in, in the more clinical context. For example, here we are looking at focal hand dystonia patients, which are patients that can kind of move around in their daily life, but for certain tasks, they cramp. And for example, for writing, which then would be called writer's cramp, or there are other forms of focal dystonia, for example, for musicians and so on. So here we, uh, learned surprisingly me, for me that it's actually not too hard to get decent activation maps in VASO for in a clinical context. Um, here, for example, nicely separating the motor cortex from sensory cortex, both in the affected and healthy hemispheres. And then using these kind of patch flattening tools, you can um, kind of span a local coordinate system in the area of interest and then look at the individual finger representations and how they're nicely somatotopically aligned in the healthy hemispheres, but in the affected hemispheres, you can see how, how messed up it is, right? There's a lot of overlap, not like we don't really see a lot of kind of consistent activation patterns here, not for the lack of sensitivity. There's a lot of significant activation going on, but there's kind of no clear structure that I could quantify. 
more quantifiable, however, is then the layer responses, specifically in the motor side of the central sulcus, where you can see that we again have this kind of bimodal response for finger movement tasks of input versus output in green, whereas for the affected hemispheres, um, this kind of input output characteristic seems to be affected. Uh, it's mostly that the superficial layers are way stronger than the deeper layers, which we don't really see so much for the unaffected healthy hemispheres. And this is interesting for um, Silvina and her colleagues because there are multiple hypotheses about the origin of focal hand dystonia, competing hypotheses. For example, um, Mark Hallett, her boss at that time, um, has a suspicion that there might be um, a lack of surround inhibition, which we would expect in the superficial layers, uh, mostly the cortical cortical input layers. And this seems to correspond quite nicely with our results. So our results kind of support that hypothesis that we have a reduced inhibition in the superficial layers and therefore kind of more blood volume change. Aside of all kind of applications, cognitive neuroscience or primary or more cognitive areas, I think the hardest study yet is layer fMRI in the primary auditory cortex. It's just, it was a mess. And I would like to explain uh, why. So here you see the first challenge which was just inflow effects that um, in the auditory cortex, you have these huge arteries that just come in and like deposit a lot of fresh inflow blood, right? In bold, you kind of still have that, but it's not as bad because the signal intensity is just not as strong as the surrounding tissue. With vaso, with the inversion pulse, the tissue signal is just lower, smaller, and therefore these inflow effects just dominate everything. Then as soon as we took care of that, with specific kind of saturation pulses, still the vessels are still there. They don't deposit signal, but they, they pulsate a lot. So if you look at the 3D EPI readout of Herschel's trirus that we would expect here based on the MP2 rate, it's just messed up, it's gone, right? Because of all this physiological noise. We try to correct for it and then minimize phase inconsistencies with a lot of different CRAPA reference scheme acquisitions. But ultimately the most efficient strategy was to just reduce the reader duration as much as possible here to 700 millisecond per volume, which basically kind of freezes physiological noise. And then you can um, have, I think 12 slices for vaso and bold, without these huge uh, physiological noise artifacts. And in VASO, you have this inherent gap of the inversion delay, which then is also quite convenient to kind of increase your, the, the perception of kind of having auditory stimuli without the scanner noise or, on all the time. And with that approach, we did get a kind of consistent results in Hirsch's trirus, also nice test, retest uh, reliabilities across layers too, where we see a nice peak in, in the kind of middle cortical layer where we would expect it. But also topographically for those studies and this protocol, you can then end up seeing kind of preferential activations for either low auditory frequencies versus high pitches, where we would expect that here in Herschel's trirus, we have this kind of red patch that's surrounded by less red activation, for example, more uh, bluish on either side in, in two participants here. So currently, layer fMRI is popular and growing a lot. In fact, it's, it's growing faster than the ultra high field community. So the number of layer fMRI papers doubles every about two and a half years, whereas the number of seven Tesla scanners only doubles about every five, six years or so. So to keep up with the growth rates, we need to expand across field strength, which is this study here together with Martin Krombichler, where we try to take advantage of some features that we have at, at three Tesla. Um, and maybe one of the political advantages is that you just have two orders of magnitude more users. They could cite your tools and then your papers and push up your age index. Though um, also importantly at 3Tesla, um, you have kind of less of these um, P0 problems and phase problems. Like in the underlay here, which is just a mean vaso signal, you do, see it, you do see that it looks more like a kind of conventional flash-based acquisition. You, you have less artifacts, it just looks like a, a structural scan. And when you scan long enough, you can see activity in, in the areas that, that we care about here for a finger tapping in task with also layer dependent modulations of this bimodal response again in the motor cortex and then the superficial layer kind of is, is reduced now looking for ipsilateral tapping and looking at the transcolossal inhibition. Okay, am I frozen? So what's the time? I'm about 40 minutes in. So I would have maybe five slides about speculating of the future of layer fMRI. Okay. Um, 
So let's speculate. So layer fMRI, the number of papers is increasing, but I think based on current trends in the last year, since 2018, I think there are new trends that I think I can extrapolate in the future. Maybe one of them is that even though the number of paper increases a lot, um, it's certain subsets that seem to be increasing a lot. So the layer fMRI has been really like methods driven for decades until about 2018 when kind of there were more papers really looking at neuroscience applications compared to the methods. In fact, the methods aspect of layer fMRI is kind of um, declining even, not even staying a constant. And when you look at the kind of neural systems that people seem to use in layer dependent fMRI, it's really still mostly the visual cortex areas, a lot of kind of primary motor areas, auditory, somatosensory, but there's definitely more kind of cognitive um, associative areas are coming in. And this is really a trend since the last few years. So I think that, and this is something that, that will catch on. The kind of publishing infrastructure seems to change a lot quite consistently. So um, when I started in maybe 2015 to 17, NeuroImage was basically our home journal. It published maybe two thirds of layer fMRI papers. And since 2017, it's just, it's just a free fall. And this might be due to their drive for higher impact. Or like they hear of many papers being rejected, but also it's getting more expensive. So even though the overall layer papers just in keep increasing, NeuroImage is not our home journal again uh, anymore. So, so we need to find something um, that will be our home journal um, very soon. Something that I don't think is changing a lot is that we are really still seven Tesla focused. About 10% is doing three Tesla, I believe, 8% right now. Maybe this will increase to 15% or so. And it's really Siemens focused still. And there are weird biases that I hope will change in the near future. Namely, when you look at the ultra, ultra high field centers, you see that about half the, um, the, the amount of seven Tesla scanners in Europe and America are roughly the same. When you look at the layer from my papers, you see that they are like double the number of layer papers come from Europe as opposed to, to America. And with Han Chang, we talked about the funding infrastructure in the in US just earlier. So maybe that's, that's a kind of being application focused or methods focused might be the thing. It's yeah, dependent on the shift of having methods papers less than application papers might have a shift there too. There's another bias that we definitely need to work on. That's quite embarrassing actually, is that we have about three quarters males as authors. And when you look at the references within layer dependent fMRI papers, only one out of seven references goes to a female author citation, which is something we really need to work on. When I um, speculate about future developments in kind of methodology, I do think there is, I, I hope that the field will work more on just making the, the readout more stable. And I showed this already with this little artifacts over here. In VASO, it's not too bad because in VASO we have two images, two inversion times. So we can just take the ratio and have a nice T1 weighted image where these artifacts cancel out. And then it looks like a flash-based image, but it's not. It, the, the kind of the artifact is still in there. You can correct for it somehow, but um, this is something we need to work on more. Also, I think the analysis is not there yet. Layer fMRI is still hard for the students. So here, um, this example refers specifically to automatic segmentation methods. So when you look at kind of um, these automatic pipelines to do tissue type segmentation for layerification later, um, it takes about 60 hours of manual labor to really go in there for a whole brain to like approve the, the segmentation accuracy until you are somewhat happy with, with the results of layer dependent fMRI because those tools were not developed with the accuracy standards of layer fMRI when they were developed. I think the Moore's law of layer fMRI resolutions will continue. We will get uh, about an order of magnitude in, in voxel resolution per decade. And there's a lot to learn at the bottom here, for example, from an image from the Feinbergertron scanner in Berkeley, you do see that with these high resolutions, you see more and more kind of layer subgroups diverging. You have more of these kind of little stripes in there. There's a lot of information to be obtained. So we should push in this direction too. And there's a very current trend also in the field that I think will catch on is namely looking at denoising methods. And while each lab has their own kind of denoising tools, and um, it's getting more and more and more, more um, people do it more and more also in their papers, not only to explore data to, for example, here looking at Nordic um, denoising, where you can basically shorten your scan times and get 
kind of decent looking activation maps um, with yeah, noisy data. But um, also a trend that I'm seeing a lot is that it's just more going to more high level. It's kind of detaching from the, the physics work that I'm doing. People do kind of more multivariate analyses where I'm not so um, kind of feeling home yet. Okay, people do more cognitive areas, more high level areas and more kind of cognitive tasks, weaker effect sizes and so on. I would like to do a bit of advertisement. There is a, a layer for my working group, namely the Laminouts. And we have a website, laminouts.com, where we organize layer um, conferences. We call them the layer dinners. And they are all online, the proceedings. And currently we are doing kind of analysis challenges, trying to find out what kind of analysis pipelines are being done by the people in the field. So basically distributing the same data set to multiple sites and then asking them, how do you get from the raw data to your layer profiles and significant activation scores later on. On Twitter, I'm trying to, be, to keep track on the, of the field and post anything, any new papers, any events that are happening in the field. And also layer FMI is it's in this weird spot between kind of um, doing research and also doing kind of being close to the vendors. So there's a lot of tricks that you need to learn how to hack your scanner, how to use a given software tool, which is not really science. So it never really finds its way to the academic literature, but still people need to know it to do good layer fMRI. So I'm, I'm trying to do, do that on, on the blog over here. And there's a specific layer fMRI software suite called Laney that I'm co-developing with for Google. There are two exciting uh, workshops coming up, um, focused on layer dependent fMRI. One, uh, directed by Jonathan Polimini at MTH in October, which is really an educational workshop where um, the speakers will not show kind of fancy slides of the latest projects that they are doing, but really doing kind of education, showing the basic principles, what are the necessary steps, what are common mistakes and so on. And then also just a week later at CMRR, as um, kind of a hands-on workshop before their ultra high field workshop, there will be a hands-on layer meeting, mostly focusing also on the analysis where we show different kind of analysis approaches, what people do, what are the tricky parts, what are the most annoying parts and what are the parts that make your data or make yeah, what is necessary to do good layer fMRI. So with this, I want to thank um, my group, fMRI F, which is headed by Peter Benettini at NIH. Before that, I worked with Benedict Poser in Maastricht, whose sequence I use for many of the images that I showed you today. With the new generation of scanners, I'm using the 3D EPI readout and the exciting sequence from Rüdiger Stürmberg in Bonn. So I want to thank him and his, his colleagues in, in, from the DZNE too. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Renzo. As always, a wonderful lecture with lots of uh, insights and uh, passion. Uh, so many, uh, uh, you know, new uh, developments and new information. Uh, you know, uh, I, and, and I need a, I need some moment to digest all this information for my brain if I ever, ever can. But in the meantime, uh, um, questions, please, um, for people who are here, uh, use the microphone when you ask the question so our online audience can hear you. For our online audience, please uh, put your question in the Q&A, then I read to everybody. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, again, I echo what uh, Jun was saying, excellent talk as always, Renzo. Um, so my question is, you mentioned about different techniques to do layer specific fMRI. How about the control agent based using, for instance, ferromoxetol? Has that field gained any momentum in the past few years? I was super excited about it when I think Mike mostly showed some results um, with like the ferrohim. Um, it do up using it in humans, but there's this black box warning and it seems to be um, very hard for some labs to kind of find people and then get the ethical approval for it. Um, I think it has its place for, I think, calibrating and understanding ways. Like ferromoxetol um, or ferrahim, they, like it has a orders of magnitude better as a contrast to noise ratio, right? It's, it, um, I think it's about um, double the SNR compared to bold and bold is about um, double to triple the, the SNR compared to VASO. So um, that's very exciting. I do, um, when we compared VASO um, with Yusin Grenze um, in monkeys um, with Mayan, no, I think that was also Farahim versus VASO, and also with an iron canola in Sheffield in, in rats, 
we did see that it's not really measuring the same thing. I think both of them measure blood volume, but the kind of the units they measure is, is, is different. So in vaso, you're basically measuring blood volume, relative blood volume in units of percent, but the unit of percent is different. So, so we had issues, especially for layer dependent fMRI, because the baseline blood volume is different across cortical layers. So in VASO, you measure blood volume per unit of tissue voxel in percent. In Farahim, Mayan, um, you measure blood volume change with respect to the baseline blood volume, because the baseline signal, even during rest, is already weighted with blood volume. So your denominator in the um, percent delta CBV is kind of different. And when you have more blood volume in the superficial layers, more baseline blood volume, your relative blood volume change, the delta CBV is kind of suppressed in the superficial layer. So it's kind of hard to get the same kind of layer dependent profiles or to, it was hard for me to reproduce the results that Sonji Kim has shown a lot with blood volume, unless you kind of know how to kind of compare the, the baseline blood volume, for example, with multi-dosage injections that we did in, in rats, for example, um, which was not your question. Um, that was my point of view to Farahim. It's, I was very excited, but not many people are catching on, um, I guess, because of the black box warning. Because if you inject it too fast and then people had allergic reactions and it was dangerous. But if you go easy with the injections, it's not that dangerous, but still FDA is concerned about it. And it's only approved for certain applications, right? If you, for this iron deficiency. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know quite some people are doing that. Mm -hmm. Of course, outside the context of FMI, like my, and my friend Yulin G at NYU is doing quite a few mm. of those, and Mark Hickey also mm. are doing some of those. I think but probably people just didn't do those FMI experiment with those right. um, fermox. So they were mainly probably look at the, as a microvascular imaging right. contrast agent, probably did not go to the FMI, FMI direction. And my second question is actually go back to the history. So when we first proposed VASO, there were two things that we said are different from board. Uh, one is a spatial specificity, which you, you kind of focus a lot on. How about the temporal features, temporal um, sort of time calls we used to say both have this undershoot and the beta don't. Has people been, have you been looking at any temporal features of these things? I did, like after we kind of got the first beta results, that was kind of the, the next playground. It's, um, so um, there was this controversy where, where I think also Peter Van Seil and, and, and I think, yeah, June yeah, definitely I mean, had, you had this article we, about- we, we, we had these right. kind of different opinions, I think, uh, right. um, 20 years ago or so, looking at mine right. versus uh, vaso-based uh, temporal time causes. I do see, like, um, because of the different normalization in Mayan versus vaso, um, I think we, we understood why the time causes are different. So in vaso, um, like we do see that the, the superficial layers, they have more undershoot compared to the deeper layers. The deeper layers are kind of more sluggish. Um, simply because kind of the, the, the actively controlled arteries, which have the smooth muscles in there, they kind of, they're faster compared to the kind of more downstream part of the vasculature, like the, the capillaries. Um, so when you, in Mayan, for example, where the superficial layers are just suppressed because um, they already kind of have a very low signal before, like during rest, this kind of faster response is kind of diminished. So with Mandeville, he saw these very slow returns to baseline. When I but simply because the, the fast response in the superficial layer was kind of gone already, was completely decayed with the dosages that were used that time. When you kind of do a multi-dosage experiments in monkeys, I do end up getting the same time courses because then the, the relative contributions of the, the kind of the more arterial actively controlled compartment and the kind of slow passively control, controlled compartment can be matched in vaso and ferrahim. On top of that, show this kind of thing in the in vivo human experiment by looking at maybe different layers of voxel will have different uh, vaso time causes. Like one have a longer uh, tail to return, the other has a more prompt, uh, faster return to baseline. We don't normally see undershoot, I don't think, in vaso, but uh, in terms of the rate of re recover, rate of re back, back to like with, we, we try to do multi echo experiments where you can kind of separate the short T to star and the long T to star component, kind of separating arterial and venous blood volume. And in the arterial component with the uh, very uh, long T to star component in the multi compartment model, we see also a very clear undershoot in base two. Um, in the kind of more downstream, kind of long short T to star component, we, we did not see that at all. In the like maybe this is a bit small. This is a screenshot out of a bigger picture. That's why the y-axis is a bit weird, but we do see that um, across layers, there are slight differences in the undershoot in vaso too. Also in the motocortic study, we saw that a bit. Though 
I think like I kind of lost interest a bit in the undershoot. Like it was a strong discussion. There's no consensus at the all at the end. And I think in your your conclusion was that both prolonged elevated C102 plus vascular plumbing artifacts can contribute it. And then the discussion shifted more and not is it this effect or that effect, but what's the relative contribution of the those two? And that's uh, yeah. Yeah, we were no. primarily looking at the visual, but uh, I guess. I don't know about other like Morocco doesn't even have a big undershoot in both. I, I don't even know, know that. We do see it. Yeah, it depends for on for the both. We do see it in both. Yeah, for both and vase. In the superficial layers and vase. In the deeper layers, it's it's tiny. And I should say though that we acquire vaso simultaneously or concomitantly with with bold. So we have this kind of vaso image and bold image, vaso image to, in order to account for both contamination in the vaso. So this means that. In the boat correction method, in the analysis for us, we kind of do a temporal interpolation between um, kind of odd and even like label control images, if, if you want. And this means that our kind of the, the interpretation of very fast responses with standard protocols is not trivial. So you're, it's, it's kind of always there's this kind of danger in the back of your mind that you might just like for these transients overestimate your, your bolt and then under or undercorrect for the bolt. So, which is also a reason why I don't have strong conclusions on yeah, the time courses there yet. But well, well, there seems to be some problem online for asking questions. So, so we open both the chat and the Q&A. So uh, if you want to ask question online, please. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I can ask you a question, uh, Renzo. I thought that was, uh, uh, whose study you showed a Sylvanus study uh, about the, the dystonia? I saw that's pretty interesting, and that's probably one of the first uh, clinical application I saw for layer uh, functional MI. Right? It's really exciting. Uh, you see the the profile difference in deep and uh, in the in the two different layers. So I was just wondering how long was the protocol in terms of the applicability for you know um, clinical um, you know application. So this was pushing a lot. Um, so the previous study where I showed the mirror finger representation, I think we had seven sessions per participant at least, which you can do in, in like a clinical population. So that was single session. Still, the I think the functional acquisition was, I think two times 20 minutes or two times 30 minutes. It was still a considerable amount of time, which might not be necessary, might not have been necessary really. Um, but like in order to have both hemispheres, um, we, we wanted to do that. Also with respect to clinic, yeah, I'm excited as, as you are. Like there's, I think there are at least five review papers of the, like how, that layer dependent fMRI would be super useful for the clinical application, looking at psychosis, looking at um, um, what do you call it? Like dementia from, I think London, there's a paper then um, psychosis in Zurich and then um, Nijmegen, I think, but there's very little like data yet. So I think, the, the race has started, right? Everybody wants to kind of show that it's useful. I think um, uh, Chang Pang from Beijing, he, they are doing kind of visual clinical applications too. I've seen an abstract yet. So, so it's just coming, yeah, wait a few years. And then, yeah, I mean, your, your study also has very strong clinical application, like, like motivation too. So I think it's just yeah, a matter of time. And then we will see more and more of this. The, I think the, the limiting part for layer-dependent fMRI that we wanted to test with Servina study was kind of in the early days of layer-dependent fMRI, there was the sequence was really, really optimized for a given like anatomical feature of that person. So the sequence developer was on the scanner, was tweaking parameters while the person was in reiterating to get kind of good images out of it. And I think this is really something that has this is a, like a thing of the past. So now you basically put a layer fMRI sequence on the scanner, push a button, and you almost always get kind of good results. So making the kind of operator of the scanner doesn't need to be the sequence developer anymore, which was an issue in the early days to make it clinical. Now that's not an issue anymore. I guess now it's the scan time. How long can you put them in there? How, how cooperative are they with the task and so on? Yeah, I feel like for clinical application, scan time is probably um, a critical factor. So perhaps, um, you know, in addition to, uh, like you should have going to uh, from 70 to 3T, 
Uh, the other important direction will be going from 40 minutes to four minutes. <laughs> That'd be a huge improvement, uh, you know, uh, for clinical application, I guess. Sure. I mean, uh, yeah, it depends on what you what your question is and what you want. Um, like, if you want, like, I like maps, right? Um, I like something like this. I want to see directly in EPI space for each voxel a good significant score, and and for that you need a lot of data. If you have a specific hypothesis about a given brain area, you don't care about maps. You can live with a lot of noise, right? You, you, you maybe don't have a good map, but instead you have kind of many, many voxels that you pull your signal from across cortical depth. And then you might be able to get away with, with four minutes if you use Nordic and then all these kind of things on top of that, maybe even short. I don't know. Nobody has done it yet. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just that. Uh... I hope. Uh, well, again, the question uh, uh, from the audience, can you comment on how the tissue specificity of vaso compares to conventional gradient code both as 3T for layer of function in my application, especially in comparison to 7T? What could the vendors do to make a layer function in my development easier as 7T and 3T, 3D EPI? Question mark. Okay. Um tissue specificity. I think um, um, this, like you see in the underlay here that three Tesla gives you an excellent T1 contrast, right? And it's kind of frustrating that while ultra high field strengths give you more SNR, the contrast to noise ratio is actually less than seven Tesla. So, so the um, kind of the, the difference, the relative difference between blood T1 and tissue T1 is actually converging. So, um, this will helps us a lot to go to three Tesla too, um, which I guess is also the, um, part of, of the question here. So the, um, maybe this is also something with, that we, we got um, from reviewer comments, namely that here we have this input output peak in the tapping experiment for the motor cortex where um, it's not as clear at three Tesla compared to seven Tesla. And this has multiple reasons. So here we used, I think an 0.8 uh, 0.82 millimeter protocol, whereas in the, in the 70 experiments, we had, I think, 0.75. So it's just a bit less resolution. We, we had to do this because we wanted to have this um, protocol available kind of for a standard technician to, to be able to execute that. So we couldn't align the, the slices to be perpendicular to the cortex, but basically wanted to run with a, a slab isotropic resolutions. Therefore, the overall effective resolution is low and it's kind of harder to separate the two peaks. Um, and therefore, maybe this um, example is not the best suited to compare kind of the, the specificity of um, three Tesla compared to seven Tesla, because it's more comparing kind of really optimized manual adjustment of acquisition and analysis to kind of a streamlined um, group comparison at, at three Tesla. What could the vendors do to make layer FMI developments easier? Um, 3D EPI is certainly, I think, the, the, the method to use, uh, the readout to use for, for layer FMI. And aside of maybe um, two big hubs, Minnesota and, and MGH, I think the, the majority of the field is to using 3D EPI, which is just um, in many applications um, kind of gives you the better SNR. In some areas, like the audit, primary auditory cortex, you might need to reconsider that because they are. 2D approaches have been way more successful over the last decades compared to our initial attempts to get something done in 3D EPI. So the vendors, they could um, support 3D EPI more openly. And there was a lot of discussion and there was an open letter to Siemens. I think you had signed it maybe. Um, so which took a while for the vendors to get on board. Uh, they, they seemed to realize the need for a good 3D EPI sequence. But by the time now, after five years, kind of custom-based sequences, for example, the, the one in Bonn, has developed to, to kind of the workhorse for, for the field already. So the, the switch will be hard, but maybe for the next upgrade to the Terra X or the XA platforms, it will be easier for the, for the vendors to catch up there. I think um, something that gives easy improvement um, from the vendors is kind of more channel counts in the RF coil and also the hardware of the gradients. So most of the seven Tesla almost all of the seven Teslas in the field are using body gradients, which are just not optimized for high resolution fMI. But still most of the seven Tesla people and centers do use it for head imaging. So uh, when I started in layer dependent fMI, I think some vendors wouldn't even like discuss having a body gradient in there, which seems to have changed. So there's a, a promising trend there. And it's something where the 
vendors can really help. Shimming is still a huge deal and problem for us. All these artifacts could be mitigated with B0, like better, more homogenized B0. So this is also something that the vendors just ignore. Face correction, we're using the face correction and shimming tools from the 90s. The field has moved on, but they didn't really, were not taken seriously from the vendors yet. This is something they could do. I could go on. <laughs> Thank you, Randall. Um, Oops. So there's a question asking because you showed the auditory, uh, you know, function MI. So there's a question asking: Have you done the olfactory uh, related brain regions? <laughs> no, no. Um, I know two people who tried, and one of them is is you. Yeah, and maybe think, we can. Yeah, it's yeah. hard. I think uh, Marcus Bard in Australia they tried, and I haven't seen it published. Like it's it's very hard. There's a lot of defacing and T2 prep with a flash based readout might be the way to go there. Uh, the other question is about individual difference in layer analysis. Yes, um, there is variation in sources of variance. Um, so far, I think nobody really has looked into kind of understanding this with respect to kind of real like person's traits um, versus kind of sources of artifacts. With Han Chang, just earlier, we talked about um, physiological sources of um, like individual differences, namely um, different people have different venous basal and oxygenation, which uh, means that, um, or they have different fitness. So as soon as the, 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 the arteries, for example, which are different cortical layers are predilated for a given kind of state or physical fitness or um, anesthesia level, you name it, disease, that would affect your layer dependent fMRI profile, which I see as a kind of an artifact. I would like to, to account for this and get rid of it. If you are interested in those kind of um, vascular effects, this might be your signal. And it is differently represented across layers. So far, people, I think, have ignored it, including me. I just, yeah. Some people do have different layer profiles. And also in VASO, sometimes we do see, specifically in Sebastian Trispa's study, that the superficial layers, they do weird things that in some people and have either strong positive vaso signal that we wouldn't expect there from the animal literature knowledge that we have, or even negative signal, which you could kind of disregard as individual difference noise, but it must have a reason. So, so we, yeah, we could investigate this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I think no more questions here. Yeah, I, I, I guess we had, we had uh, 15 minutes over one, uh, one hour. So I guess we, uh, we should stop here. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, for a uh, local audience, uh, if you want to ask more questions, you are more than welcome to stay. Um, you know, again, um, uh, I want to thank everyone. I think we had uh, for the first hybrid, uh, you know, experience, we had a record attendance today. Um, and uh, I want to also I want to take this chance to thank uh, Anthony and Alex, um, you know, for supporting the, the uh, you know the AV support and everything. This is really wonderful. Um, um, but the most important, I think, we should thank our speaker again, you know, for the wonderful talk. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. We will see you next month. Thank you.